Wisdom Window is a company that is sponsoring this tonight. We're excited to have these different speakers, and hopefully some of you come from one and are going to learn and enjoy from another one. So we invite you to stay and have a good time while you're here. Um, Wisdom Window is a place where you can go to find people like this who have learning lessons to teach, and you can learn and, and, uh, and be taught by them. And uh, we invite you to, to visit our website, wisdomwindow.com, and learn a little bit about us. We've registered you all, so you're now members, and membership is free. You're going to get emails and other things that will give you updates of things that are coming up, uh, future events, and so forth. Um, and I hope you'll, you'll find we just launched it a few weeks ago, so we're young, and we're getting up growing and having good experiences already. But I'd like to take a moment and introduce you to Scott McIntosh. Um, he's made a career of learning from life's lessons. With a diverse background in sales, concrete construction, hunting and raising seven children, Scott knew something was found to go wrong, and it has. If you have lots of children, you can agree and understand. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, many times things have gone wrong for him, as you can imagine, thus resulting in countless learning experiences relevant to success and relationships in life. He's been married for 30 years. He's a grandpa. You've probably seen him on TV. He'll tell you more about that, I'm sure, as he goes. Uh, he's been on the Today Show, Good Morning America, and a number of other places. But let's take a moment and let's welcome Scott. Well, thank you. Um, see if I can get this mic adjustment so it's working good. Can you hear me all right there? Yeah. This is a great opportunity to be here and to speak to you tonight. Uh, it's been exciting to to be a part of this and to be invited and, and to speak with such great other people and share the stage with them. Uh, some of the people who I'm sharing the stage with, uh, if you've got to know them a little bit, are very educated people. I learned my education through the School of Hard Knocks, which is a little bit different than maybe the way they, they learned theirs, but I did have some education and I'm, I'm very uh, big on education. In fact, the other day I was talking to my son uh, who was, I overheard him speaking with his friends. And when I heard them speaking, they were talking about how they couldn't wait for school to end. And I thought, how could you be so excited for school to end? I loved school. That was one of my favorite times of my life. And I said, why do you, why do you want school to end? And they said, because it's just, hell, I'm just so tired of all the homework and all the assignments and all the study. And, and I looked at him and I said, well, duh, yeah, if you do all that kind of stuff, it's not very fun. But, you know, if you just go to school to be, you know, part of the crowd and have a good time with all the people and improve your social skills, school can be a great place to create relationships. And so, although these guys that we're speaking with tonight are a little bit higher on that eleva elevation as far as their education, I need to tell you that I do have a background in school. I went to the University of Utah as well as BYU, and I uh, didn't have a big problem with the rivalry. I went, I went to both schools. Uh, actually, I went to dances at both schools, and uh, and so that was pretty much the basis of my whole education of college was going to school dances. But I have had some lessons that I've learned throughout my life, and, uh, and those lessons I'm going to talk to you tonight, those are my life's lessons, uh, life lessons that I've learned in raising children, uh, being married, and just learning what works and what doesn't work. And so I wanted to start off just a little bit uh, talking about passions, things that I'm passionate about. I think each one of us has something that gets us up in the morning, makes us motivated. My son, my older, oldest son one day, he mentioned to me that the things that are we're remembered for in this life probably don't get, us, get said a lot about until the day of our funeral. And so when at our funeral, they're going to be talking about the things that people remember me by and you by, and, and, and on your funeral, that's what they're going to talk about. And it's, it is sometimes the things that we wanted them to talk about aren't necessarily those things that are going to get talked about. And the thing that I realized in, in, in this process was there's a lot of things I'm passionate about. And I would love to be known for that. When, I, when they speak about me at my funeral, I want them to say, this guy loved archery. 
He loved archery. That was his passion. That was his thing that he just that made him click. The mystical, magical flight of the arrow. The just the, the peace and tranquility you receive by just being out there and, and shooting your bow and target practicing. But not only that, not only did I want to be known as just an archer that would be talked about when they mentioned the greats, Robin Hood, you think they'd be talking about Scott McIntosh and Robin Hood in the same sentence? That's what I wanted. That's my passion. But I didn't think that was going to happen. I wanted to be known as the best elk hunter that ever lived, the best archery elk hunter. That's, that's what I live for. I love being in the mountains. I love all of those types of things. But I found a flaw in my desire, and that was that it takes a lot of time away from your family. And in order to be away from your family, that's something I wasn't willing to give up. As much as I love doing those things, I don't want to leave my family to do it enough to become known for it. So something else that I was really in love with in my life was horses and cowboy. I love cowboy. That's, that's, that's a great part of life. So why don't I be known as the greatest cowboy that ever lived? I love cowboy poetry. I like riding horses. I like taking a young colt and working with him and getting him to the point where when I ask him to do something and he does it, I can sit there and realize that the only reason he did that was because I taught him. That is a very rewarding feeling to work with a young animal and get that feeling. So I'm going to be known as the best cowboy. How's that? Well, you know what? I had to compete against this guy. <laughs> How do you compete against that as the best cowboy ever? So bottom line is we don't get to choose what we're known for. I asked my children one day, I said, hey, you guys, I'm going to be doing a lot of speaking. I need you to give me a list of the life lessons that you've learned while being in our home. What's some of the things that you've gained from your mother and I that we've taught you and that I could talk about and share with people? the lessons came flooding in. They didn't have a problem remembering those lessons. The problem was none of them I wanted to share with you. <laughs> they told me things that were embarrassing to me. They remembered me on my worst days. They remembered me when I wasn't doing a good job of being a parent. But that's the things they remember. And they laugh about it. They think it's hilarious. Um, they don't hold grudges against me, but they remember those things. So do we get to be known for that? I don't think so. I'll tell you what I'm known for. This is what I'm known for. Has anybody seen that picture at all? <laughs> you people have seen that. Well, you know what? You guys may laugh and think, oh, crap. He doesn't get to be known as the world's greatest cowboy. He doesn't get to be known as the world's best bow hunter. He has to be known as the guy in the short shorts for the rest of his life. Well, I see it just a little bit different than you. Because when I look at that picture, I see something right across my chest. Best dad ever. That's what I want to see. Who wouldn't want to be known as the best dad ever? But it's not something that's easy to, to accomplish. It's not something that's easy to get voted into. I don't think anybody else in here would vote me as the best dad ever. And I think there's a lot of days that my kids wouldn't vote me as the best day at dad ever. And there's a lot of times where I would not even think that I was even in the running for it. But on this one particular instance, we had an event in our, in our home where some things changed and some things worked out to where I had to step up and become a different person. And my older daughter, Kelsey, uh, had created or had given me the shirt for Father's Day. Have you guys ever received a shirt or some kind of a gift and you're thinking, where am I ever going to use this or ever, like in the shirt, where am I going to wear it ever? I'm not going to walk into the store wearing the best dad ever shirt. But I could wear, maybe wear it camping. Maybe I could wear it on Father's Day the next year. But I'm not going to wear it everywhere. Well, one day as I was sitting there in my home, well, I came home um, to, to do a, a family activity. Once a week, we try to do a family activity. And on this instance, I came home to greet my family, and I knew what the plan was. My son, my younger son, Sky, who's a junior in high school, he had planned this event. He says, let's go out to dinner. We haven't been to dinner for a long time. 
And he says, and after that, let's go take our pass of all passes and let's go to Trafalgar and we'll uh, do some miniature golfing. Well, that sounded great. We were excited about this. Well, I came home and as parents, sometimes we realize that we have to adjust. Is there, I don't know if there's any teachers in this room, but I think all of us try to teach at some instance in our lives. And some of the things that we teach, we think are perfect. We've got this thing all mapped out. I've got this lesson that I'm going to teach, and it's going to be so rock solid. And then things change, and it doesn't work out that way. And sometimes we have to adjust, and we have to step up to the next level. And, and on this instance, my son had told me uh, something that I should do. I laughed about it, and I thought, that's funny, but I would never do that. Well, I came home to get ready for this night. And when I came around the corner and I saw the way my daughter was dressed, my mind went into crazy mode, and I went and did the thing that I swore I would never do that my son had thought was funny. And so I remember I told you guys a little bit that I, I like cowboy. And so I do cowboy poetry. And so when all this, uh, when all this instance, incident happened, my wife, she told me, because it was getting a little bit out of control, the stories were getting misconstrued, and she asked me to write the, rewrite the story, but I'm going to get into that in a little minute. But after that, she asked me to, to write it in cowboy poetry form. So not cowboy poetry so much as a little hit poetry, but I'm going to tell you the story in poetry form. So let me tell you a little story. It's kind of magical of sorts. It's a story of love and craziness involving some shorty shorts. It was early on a Monday night, and miniature golf was in the mix. But not before we went out to eat some of that Japanese with them chopsticks. My wife had asked my daughter to make a change in her attire. Her shorts were a bit too short, you see, but who could know what would transpire? Well, if making a change is what's required, then I'll just stay at home. That's what my daughter said to her. But what do you do when they're near full grown? Well, as any darn good dad would do, you come up with a plan. I thought I'd make them laugh instead of fight. Why, they call me Superman. So up the stairs to grab some jeans, I rummaged through my clothes. These would only be worn once, but only heaven knows. Well, I found a pair of tattered jeans, beat up from lots of use, and with scissors cut them into shorts, barely hiding my caboose. <laughs> the pockets were hanging out the bottom, just like the kids nowadays. I tried them on, I cut some more. <laughs> and I was so short they wore the maze. They were perfect, and to my liking, these pants I did convert, but to make the outfit all complete, I needed me a shirt. Well, one reached up and grabbed me. Best dad ever was on the chest. Now this would be the cherry on top to my modesty request. So down again to meet the fam in my newly adorned outfit, a shortened pause to muster strength and need to recommit. I wanted this lesson to make its point, to sink in a little deeper. But standing there in them Daisy Dukes, man can seem a creeper. <laughs> with chest puffed out and chin held high, I met my wife's first glance with a worried look upon her face that said, Honey, what happened to your pants? <laughs> well, I told her what the plan was, to uphold my family name, to teach my children modesty, but her look was still of shame. Well, she quickly climbed on board because she's an understanding wife, not knowing for a second, though, how these shorts would change our life. Well, in the truck we drove to town, neither of the kids had known of the spectacle that sat in front of them because their faces were in their phones. <laughs> well, I shocked the kids when we stopped to eat, and I stepped outside my truck. <laughs> Why couldn't they have a normal dad? <laughs> this was just bad luck. I wanted to hear those words come out. Why, Dad, you're such a sport. I love what you just did for me. Now let's go home and change our shorts. <laughs> If I'd have held my breath for those words that never came, I'd be dead and buried now, with only me to blame. But drastic times calls for drastic measures, so inside we went to eat. I tried my best to avoid the stares, 
But heck, it was tough to be discreet. <laughs> With hand on hip, I read the choices of the meal that looked the best. <laughs> Not knowing that my kids snapped pictures. Now let me tell you of the rest. Ten minutes sat and eating now. <laughs> Feeling glad I'm not a quitter. All at once my son blurts out, I've got 60 shares upon my Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> he went on to say that he posted a picture that was being seen by all. He showed my wife and my daughter too. Now they get on the ball. My wife signed on to Facebook. My daughter to her Tumblr. Both posted pics and stories too. I kind of felt outnumbered. But what the heck, I had no pride. My lesson had met the devil. But to give up now would admit defeat. So let's take it to another level. I blurt, all at once I blurted out, miniature golf still in the plans. Well, that's when they gave me goofy looks, or so it soon began. But we golfed all night on borrowed nerve. Amidst the stops and stares, nervous though to pick up my ball for what it might just bear, <laughs> we grabbed some shakes and headed home. Was a lesson learned? Well, time will tell, but what's for sure, she knows of my concern. I didn't need to get uptight or read the riot act. Just teach with love and humor so she didn't feel attacked. We still laugh about that night when we were all good sports, but they'll never give their dad another reason to wear them shorts. <laughs> <laughs>
my daughter had posted on her Tumblr that her dad did a wonderful act that night. He put on some shorts because her mom had asked her to take to change her pants or change her shorts into something more modest, and she didn't want to do that. So her loving dad wore some shorts so he could show respect to her and that he supported her in her decision. <laughs> so that wasn't the message. That was not the message at all. My wife says, Scott, you need to rewrite the story, or write the story, excuse me. Sit down and write the story, the real story of the short shorts. So I, I says, what for what? And she says, to put on a blog. I'm not a big blogger. I'm a male of our species, right? I don't think <laughs> blogging even exists. So I'm like, who reads blogs? And I, I'm sorry for those I offended. <laughs> who are males also? And, <laughs> I, uh, as any good husband will do, you do what you're told. And I told her, are you serious? So I'm going to put this on your blog. How many people are going to read it? Four people? Well, she knows we have seven children, so she's thinking at least seven are going to read it. But I know my children, and I'm still thinking four is a high number. <laughs> and I tell her, okay, I'll do this. And I sit down, and I write this whole story. And I started off with not everybody's definition of modesty is the same as mine. But in my home, this is what I try to portray. And I went through the whole story, and then I finished it up, and got down to the end, and I, uh, and I wrote, why would a dad go to this kind of lengths to teach his daughter a lesson? It's out of love. It's because of love. It wasn't to humiliate her. It wasn't even to embarrass myself. But it was to let her know how much I cared about her, and I wanted her to know of her great work. I wanted her to know of a great word. And I ended it up with, moral of the story, modest is hottest. Well, that got coin phrase. That went crazy. And that's the part that I, they all think that I came up with that. <laughs> and, uh, and so from there, uh, anyway, my wife put it on her blog. She posted it on her Facebook and her Twitter. And the next few days taught me a valuable lesson of social media. A few more people than four people read it. A few more people. Pretty soon I'm hearing from Deseret News. I'm hearing from uh, KSL, and they want to do an interview. And I still can't believe that anybody wants to talk to me about this. But this is going everywhere. It's everywhere. And so, in fact, let me tell you, let me just show you where it went here. Let me show you a video. This is from my older daughter, the one that gave me the shirt. She, uh, she created this video for me. Oh. Uh oh. Okay. We're not showing the video. <laughs> this video went, or this video, this video showed where it went. I had calls the next few days from Inside Edition, from Good Morning America, from the Today Show, from CNN, from Fox and Friends. I did shows in um, Japan, I did shows in Australia. I got a letter one day when I was over at my parents' house, and I opened the envelope from these people in Inverness, Scotland. Inverness is at the top of Scotland. It's not even the biggest city there. And these people who knew my parents sent them a little article from their newspaper of about a guy in Utah who cut his shorts off. It was everywhere, everywhere. I cannot express enough how you've got to be careful on what things you put on social media. I was glad to get it turned around in the right direction because all of the stories, and I wish you could have seen this, were the story of love. When I'm sitting there at night watching Jay Leno, and all of a sudden Jay Leno starts talking about this Utah dad who cut his shorts off, people are calling me, did you see Jimmy Fallon tonight? He's talking about you. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. But the reason that I did that was solely out of love for my daughter. And that's the thing that I wanted to get the point across. And so from that point, we started receiving comments. The comments were flooding in on all kinds of media. 
And they were funny. Some of them were, hey, great dad, good job dad. Hey, I would never have the guts to do that. Good for you, you know, that type of thing. I had all the, 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 the bad comments too and, and told me what an idiot I was. And I didn't really care about that. That didn't bother me any. They didn't really know the story of it. But the overwhelming comment that I got continuously, over and over and over, was a comment just like this. I wish that somebody cared about me enough to do something like that. That stopped me in my tracks. My entire life, I wanted to be a speaker. And I know you guys are sitting there thinking, why would you want to be a speaker? You're horrible at it. I've always wanted to speak to teens and parents. Because I thought I wanted to to be able to add to life, to be able to help them to understand some of the things that I'm And it's just been a dream of mine. My wife would say, Scott, what do you want to do in this life? I'd say, I'd love to speak. She goes, you don't have a platform. One was given to me. One was given to me. I get to have this opportunity now to speak to people and tell them about how people add value, how relationships add value to our lives. I had a situation, um, a, well, I had a situation happen just a little bit later, and, uh, excuse me, earlier in life, that made me the way I am on this event here. And I'll explain this to you. When I was young and married, probably three years into our marriage, I, uh, I'm a big hunter. I told you that earlier. I love to hunt. Does anybody duck hunt? Raise a hand, anybody ever chase ducks a little bit? Nice. So I live for that kind of stuff. I just love to be out there, whether it be in a boat, whether it be on a stream, whether it be in the mountains, anything. I just love being in the outdoors. Well, we'd go out to Farmington Bay, me and my brothers, and we'd duck hunt. And on this one occasion when we went out there, we took the kayak with us because we learned something. This pond out there had all these ducks sitting on it, and nobody could get out to the center of this pond. And so we decided we're going to go out and we're going to chase them up. We're going to get out there with our kayak. You couldn't take a motorized boat on them, but you can take a kayak. So it was my turn to run the kayak. We only had one. And my brothers, they went walking down the dike and off I went. It was a cold, miserable, son of a gun day. The wind was howling. The waves were just choppy, choppy waves. So cold, you could look across the lake and see that about two-thirds of the lake was open and about a third of it was frozen. And so I couldn't really see how far out there that frozen lake was, but I got in the kayak and I thought, this is going to be miserable, but you know what, let's go do it. So off I took off. It turned out to be one of the best days I'd ever had. It was phenomenal. That wind at my back, I could get after them ducks so much faster than I had in the past. I didn't have to work near as hard to paddle. All I had to do was fly across that lake. They'd jump up, I'd get some shooting, and I was just, I was having a fall. Great day to be a duck hunter, and not a great day to be a duck. And, <laughs> and I was having fun. Well, bottom line is, pretty quick I'm on the other side, and I'm against the ice. I thought, well, this is great. I'll turn around, I'll go shooting back across the lake, I'll get another angle, and I'll hit it again, because that was so great. I turn around, and I start to dig in, and I start to paddle. And it's cold. And the, way, the waves are coming over the front of the boat because the wind's blowing so hard, and I'm trying to go into it now. And as I sat there paddling with everything I had, I went till I got tired. And I stopped, and I put the oars across my lap. I was in a boat just exactly like that. I put the oars across my lap, and I sat there to rest for a minute. Boom, immediately, I was... Every wave knocked me into the ice behind me. I hadn't gone anywhere. I was just going to scoot across that lake and have another run at it, and I couldn't even move. Well, I thought, okay, I better start digging in a little deeper. And I started to dig, and I started to paddle with everything I had, and I went, and I went, and I went, until I felt, or I could taste blood in my throat. Anybody runners? Anybody had that moment of life when you've done something so vigorous that you can just taste blood in your throat? And I got to that point, and I was exhausted. And I stopped, and I just sat down a breather, and immediately, boom, boom, I'm back into the ice. I hadn't gone anywhere. I started to realize I was in trouble because I did that several times, and I wasn't moving. Finally, after sitting there in about four inches of water, my body is soaking wet. My pants, I don't have any 
waders on. I'm just sitting in the boat in my jeans, and I'm soaked. I'm sitting in ice cold water. I've got my coat, but I push on my coat, and it breaks. Not my coat breaks, but all the ice that's on my coat just breaks. My gloves, all I have is these really nice cowhide gloves. That's all I had. I didn't, we didn't have Gore-Tex back then. All I had was some cowhide gloves that were soaking wet. And that wind hit me in the face. Every little bead of water that blasted off the front of my boat felt like needles stinging me as it hit me into the face. I had never witnessed cold like that. I would never witnessed fatigue like that. And I gave everything I had. And I did it over and over and over until finally I was done. And I sat there with the oars across my lap, my throat just burning, my chest just pumping, and my face down against my chest. And I remember saying, I'm done. Just take me, I'm done. You hear the stories on the news of people who have died in those kinds of environments, and you think as you're sitting there in your warm house, well, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? I was in that moment where I knew I was going to die. I was going to die right then. And I sat there banging into that ice, just bang, bang, waiting to die. And I wondered how long it would take. Not thinking it was going to take very long because I've never been this cold. I've never been in this situation. But I knew I was done. And it wasn't that I wanted to die. I wanted to live. I just couldn't do it anymore. I could not give any more effort than I'd already given. There was nothing left inside this physical body to go further. And I sat there banging into that ice with my head against my chest. And all of a sudden, the thoughts started creeping into my head. And the first thought that came in was a two-year-old kid, just a little dark-haired kid that resembled me. And he was at home, and he was my son. And he had no idea what his dad was going through. He didn't know, but it had an effect on me. That's all I could think about. And then I thought of his sister, a beautiful little daughter who was just nine months old, blonde hair, blue eyed, gorgeous little girl. Who was going to raise these kids? These were my kids. Why was I giving up? I couldn't give up, but I had nothing left in me. Would they understand? Would they understand that I couldn't do any more, that I'd given my all? Well, as I sat there banging into that ice, I thought of my wife, and I thought of all my children, or my two children, excuse me, and something inside me says, you've got to try again. You've got to. I picked up those oars, and I started to dig, and I started to dig with the same fury that I did before, and nothing felt different. That was the crazy thing. Nothing felt different. I knew that I'd given my all the first time, but I had to do it again. I couldn't quit without at least trying one more time. And I started to go. And I started to dig, and I started to dig, and finally I had nothing left in me. I was so exhausted, I stopped. And I waited to hit that ice, and it didn't happen. I looked over my shoulder, and surprised, I was 30 yards off of the ice. How did I do that? How did I get further away? Because I felt that I'd done the same thing as before. Well, that invigorated me, and I started to dig some more. And I kept doing this. And pretty soon, I was on the other side of the lake pulling my boat out of the water. Something that I had given up on earlier because I had nothing left in me now became a reality that it saved my life because I quit living for myself. I didn't put my value of life as the highest value. My family's value, that's what made me live. They added value to my life. I hope that nobody in this room feels that they do not add value to somebody's life. That not one person here thinks that somebody wouldn't go across that frozen lake when they were giving up on themselves but they would go across there because of you. And I realize the sadness of it is there's some people that don't have that connection, don't feel like there's somebody out there. But it's up to you to make sure that other people who you associate with don't ever feel that they don't add value to your life. Let them know. Tell them what great lengths you would do. Go home tonight and tell your kids how much they mean to you. 
Tell your brothers and your sisters, tell your family, tell your friends what value they add to your life. That's why years later I was willing to look like an idiot and go out on the town in my short shorts for my daughter because she added value to my life. I would have gone up the lake for her. It would have been the same thing. I would have done it for her. That's the kind of things that we want to learn. That's the kind of stuff, that's the message that I want to send is of the great worth that everybody has in this life. I've, this is a pretty important quote. People have seen it. I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Does anybody believe that's true? Pretty true, isn't it? I put a little twist to it. I have a habit of doing twists. This is what I came up with. I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, unless you did something really embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> they don't forget. They do not forget. But I'm telling you, they don't forget how I made them feel. That's the difference. And my kids, they're unbelievable. They're unbelievable, and they're resilient. And I can be sometimes where I told you all those stories that I wish they didn't have in their minds. I, I wish they were gone, but they don't forget, but they don't hold it against me. They don't hold it against me. Did you know that everybody in this room is an unrepeatable miracle? That's, that's astounding to me, because that's just those people in this room. Do you realize that everybody in this city is an unrepeatable miracle. And you realize that everybody, not only on this earth, but who's ever lived on this earth, has something of value to add to others that is unique to them. That is the coolest thought that you could ever think of. I love that thought. This is what Dr. Seuss had to say. Today you are you. That's truer than true. Nobody alive is you or than you. Why do you think he said that? If he didn't think you were unique, if he didn't think that you had some value to add to life. Again, I have to twist things and I mix it up and I added this part. Dr. Seuss was the lad that believed in that fad. But to not understand it is sadder than sad. So just so believe in your you, because no one knows who, your you will affect and help them come through. We all need each other, like sister or brother, to just be ourselves, not smother the other. Your you's not a fraud, for this I applaud, for he who made you, we know him as God. Thank you very much, you guys.